1906, a fellow named William Taliaferro moved from Texas into what was then called Pickens County in the Chickasaw Nation. He had a big ranch and a farm near Oakland, and then in 1900, when the Frisco Railroad built through, they took his land, built a train station there, and that became the town of Medill. The name came from a Judge Medill, who was on the board of directors of the St. Louis and San Francisco Railroad, the Frisco Railroad, and so his name became the name of that town. Oakland was the largest town in what was then called Pickens County and was the county seat. However, because the railroad built two miles away from Oakland and this new town that, that sprung up around the railroad station and became Medill, uh, it overgrew uh, and overtook uh, the population of Oakland. Oakland uh, didn't grow the way Medill did because Medill had the railroad and transportation railroads were very, very important uh, in the establishment of towns and the growth of towns at that time in our history. I can remember back when I was just a kid, you know, coming around this square and I was only like six or seven years old. And uh, we'd always meet our grandparents in the corner over here at that time. And the town square was the center of life in that town, particularly in county seats, and that was true in the Dill. They built the courthouse, the uh, retail district, businesses established themselves in the streets that surrounded that courthouse creating the town square. And that, that was really part and parcel of living in a town like Medill, uh, particularly in a county seat. Lake Texoma is here uh, within about seven miles of Medill. Starting in 1940 with the construction of Denison Dam, which created Lake Texoma, and then Lake Murray, those two lakes in close proximity to Medill have increased tourism uh, and have brought other economic benefits to Medill. So Medill has really, really benefited from the location of not just one major lake, but two major lakes. During the summertime, uh, tremendous amount of traffic. Uh, in the summertime, you can't get anyone to believe that the population of this community is like 3,500. Everybody is really proud of Medill, the way it's growing, and we have wonderful churches, uh, good schools, wonderful hospital. Like most small communities, revolves around churches and schools. Uh, very much a, a football community. Football kind of works its way to the top as it does in each community in this area. They all stick together, they work together, they're good about going to all the ball games and, and all the benefits they have here. As the railroads were building lines through and building train stations and towns were springing up around these train stations, one of the first group of people or the first person to come into that town was a banker. Local banks were the lifeline of that town. You couldn't build things, you couldn't build buildings, you couldn't build homes without loans from the bank. The prosperity of the town was dependent upon the bank and the bank was dependent upon the prosperity of the town, the things that that bank was, was financing. My great uncle was one of the founders of the Medill National Bank. His name was Robert Lee Davis. The bank then, when Dad came, there were only four employees, counting Dad. And it, if I remember correctly, it was one room. One of the remodels before 80, I'm not sure which one, uh, they actually cut 12 foot off of the, of the building. I know the upstairs part was the uh, phone company uh, back when uh, the operators pulled a plug and put it in another one, just the old TV movies. My dad would carry me up to the second floor and uh, to where the telephone office was. And the best I remember they would put me in their lap and there would be a call come through and here there were little buttons and they would do the buttons and then get the message and then they picked up something else and plugged it in up here. It just fascinated me. I remember you could call and ask for someone and they would connect you to them whether they were at their home or business. They, they seemed to know where everyone was. I remember 
work there as a teller. They came in from the square and drove straight through to the route, uh, the road behind the bank. Very busy, very busy. It uh, had a tunnel uh, and entered off the square and, and uh, exited on Tolliver Street at the back. Uh, this is back in the 40s and uh, cars was lined up here sometimes three deep. I uh, worked there some, loved it. I got to visit with everybody that came through. The last remodel uh, of this bank was in 81. Mark Landrum was very active in facilities and uh, franchise building, obviously, and planning. Uh, we have done several startup uh, projects, several remodels. Uh, I won't say this was necessarily on the list, but uh, it kind of came to the top of the, of the priority list. The exterior of the, of the old building, it didn't have any insulation, and you could just feel the wind literally in the wintertime just blowing through. And so we really started looking at maybe we'd go in and insulate those exterior walls. We, we were very fortunate in this project. I uh, worked with Mike Murphy, our architect, uh, Micon Construction on our uh, general contractor. So we, we had a pretty good system and, uh, you know, going into this project. It really started as an idea to remodel the interior existing bank, bring it up to kind of current uh, technology, current aesthetics. And the outside was considered to be, uh, we, would, we would eliminate some of the uh, panels and, and facility uh, and remodels that had occurred over the years and go back to maybe a brick building and get rid of some of the aggregate panels. Well, when we got to talking to the different, uh, I guess, mechanical people, electrical people, plumbing people, we found that we might ought to look at just kind of gutting the thing and starting all over. There was some uh, input from the community. There was interest by people that worked at the bank that had been here for some time, that recalled some of the things in the past, and then other people in the community hearing about it, just kind of resurrecting some thoughts. Each week at church, a lot of input. <laughs> I, I doubt that there were very many days that I did that, that didn't talk to someone that had memories. And uh, besides being very interesting and talking to friends, uh, we actually use that input. Historical remodels are actually probably my favorite type of construction to do. They're not done generally uh, as much as, as new construction is because of the cost and because of the different aspects of it. But this didn't actually start off like this. This started off as a pretty typical remodel. You know, there were no original drawings, but some of the drawings we found over the phases of the construction back in the 40s and 50s and 60s you know, gave us a little indication of what might be here, but we really didn't know for sure. And due to the lack of not having drawings and not having historical data on what was here, we actually, Micon actually came in and we actually had to do the demo to see what was here. They started kind of busting through some walls. I remember receiving the photographs via email and everybody was amazed that the arch was there, there was some original columns there, uh, and they had just drywalled over it when they uh, did a renovation back in the 70s. So we were quite excited that, uh, as a designer, it kind of gives you a base to start building on. When we uncovered it, gosh, the thing was in pretty good shape, really. It was unbelievably good shape. Uh, the general contractor demoing the non-historic veneers discovered some of the old original historic components of the early 1900s bank building that existed here before. The entryway itself is a, is a native Oklahoma shale limestone. It has a lot of, uh, of, of fossil features in it. It's very, uh, uh, very native and it was cored here at the time. The columns that you see behind me are Italian granite, they're polished and they were, of course, shipped in. Um, the top of the, the structure was damaged and uh, the exterior veneer in general was in medium to poor condition. So the owners in the planning phase elected to reinstall a updated veneer of brick and cast stone. We 
when we discovered the entrance, we knew we needed to uh, find some kind of stone, a, a local stone, because obviously at that, when this was constructed uh, in the early 1900s, obviously it was local stone. Uh, we knew we couldn't match it. Actually, we were coming back from uh, lunch one day, uh, Justin Jeffers, Mike Murphy, and myself, and we're driving down the highway, and, and Mike looks over there and says, uh, there's the stone right there in that building. I had read in the local paper uh, a few weeks before that the city had actually uh, started the process to, to condemn the building. That's as close as we're going to get, closer than anything we could get by any other process we went through. So I contacted actually the owners of the building and was able to make a, a deal with them. The demolition crew that was up here working on the inside, because this was early on with the process, uh, they were already up here, they had their equipment here. So uh, we got a pretty good deal on that because they didn't have any travel time or uh, moving. So they, they went over, uh, tore it down, uh, piled the rock up, and we were able to use the, the stone. They demoed an eyesore, and we were actually able to incorporate that stone to use on this facility. Some of that stone off that building is has been ground down and is sitting on this entryway right now. And it's sitting on the pilasters next to us as accent pieces. So we took a, we took an old dilapidated building that wasn't you know doing anything but but rotting and we actually took it and incorporated it into the construction of this facility. We needed the stone. Uh, just so happened we could get it. Uh, we purchased the property from the individual. So they won, that, that they probably weren't going to get anything out of. So yeah, it, it was a win-win for a lot of people. We thought it would be a great idea to landmark the main entryway. It is historically restored. The, um, the stonework was veneered in place. We then textured it to historic specs and it's framed by the brick you see around it. We also installed two historically correct columns to either side of the entry to uh, kind of uh, set off the corner stone of this bank building. After finding it, and then making it the focus piece and using it to help make the barrel vault coming in and then seeing how it ended up in the end, I still think it's probably my favorite. What's unique about this project is, is you're building what's not on the drawings because you are, you, you are on, in a constant state of change. When we got to the interior and we started moving in the direction of a little more historical sensitivity, we were trying to look at some of the products and some of the visual effects that would relate a little bit to some of the periods that the bank had gone through. And so we, went, we wanted to go with the hardwoods. We usually use a cherry finish on most of them. We try to stay standard. Uh, this took on a little different finish. It's a walnut and um, it was um, very um, popular back uh, in that period of time, back in the early 1900s. It's not a frou-frou traditional, it still has kind of some uh, very fine lines, um, very linear, almost um, arts and crafts look. It was kind of a challenge to get this much walnut, um, to, to get a clean, not free walnut um, that had good character they were looking for. Um, the, the cherry seems more readily available they've used on the other ones, so this one was a little bit of a challenge to get it all matched up and get that kind of volume of walnut. Walnut has its own specifications, grade specifications, because it generally has a lot more knots in it and defects, so it's a lot more of a challenge to work with it and get enough material that's clean enough to, to use for the bank here. The teller line, you know, it kind of dates back to more of the early period but it's also the granite materials are something that is currently used, whereas in the past it might have been marble. Uh, we wanted to bring in uh, some granite. Probably back when the bank was originally done, it was probably marble. Uh, that was a really popular, marble's much softer uh, than granite. Um, 
you see the, even the wear from the bills going across the deal plate on the marble, not so much on the granite. I can remember as a small child coming in with my parents to the bank and thinking how impressive it was at that time. The teller stations were a white type Carrera marble base, but then they had wrought iron bars uh, covering the tellers. And my first impression of that was is that I remember asking my parents, why are those people in jail? Put this canopy above the teller line either for some practical purposes, but also to speak to the original design of the teller line. It, it gives us task lighting. It scales down the space over the teller line. It also speaks to the original tellers, which were cages. You know, the structure went, you, you weren't open, it went all the way up about nine or 10 feet and you were caged in for security and, and a sense of a bank present. So this was sort of, kind of a nod to that sort of historical significance. But, but also had practical implications. This building's gone through many renovations. The door to the vault, the original vault, actually the door was where the TV is that we put on the waiting area. And then over uh, one, one, one of their remodel phases, that door was relocated to its new location. It, it's a vault and it's called a vault for a reason. It's a massive, massive object and with thick walls and steel plate and when you when you're when you're framing walls and you're 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 putting up paneling and, and trimming out wood and uh, you if you need to change a quarter inch or you need to, to move a half inch it's easy to do but when you have a 50,000 pound vault you're not moving it so you uh, change your design and, and, and go to the vault you know, it's a large vault, it's larger than most vaults. It, it, it is really handling all the safety deposit boxes. It, it isn't is used as much for cash today as it was in the past. And that's one, you know, one of the reasons the size and the way they're constructed. The old bank had 10 ceilings in it. There were some black and white photos, but nothing that were in color, of course, in 1909 that you could really tell what color. When the contractors, they started looking at that, they said, okay, we can kind of do something like that. We thought we had like three focus areas here when you, we'd have the entry, the teller line, and then we were actually looking at a focus where the waiting was, and the ceiling was almost a, a, a secondary thought in that focus. But that was when the original thought was there. As it developed and, it, and, and, the, and we went further with the development, it became the primary focus. We were, we were always looking at a beam ceiling to break it into quadrants and, 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 and kind of speak to what was done in a lot of the early uh, designs of the turn of the century through the 30s. We started talking about putting a tin ceiling in and uh, we originally were looking at doing just that, a tin ceiling and painting it. Uh, most of the period back then, they didn't even really paint it or if they painted it, it was black. Uh, we knew we wanted to keep with a very linear, uh, almost a Art Deco square. It was really critical that we got it all lined up, um, being straight lines that it is. It, it visually, it had to line up. Um, it was very critical. Um, so there was a lot of effort with that. And that's all overhead up on scissor lifts and um, not like working on the ground. So it was, it was quite a challenge to get it all lined up and get it straight. And the lights, the, the, the chandelier effect, and even the lights that are in the offices, the schoolhouse design, are all period pieces trying to reflect some of that period between the 30s and 50s, and maybe a little bit before and a little bit after, and address how they would be lighting then, and how we can you know, take what was used in that format, but, but use current technology, current light fixtures, high efficiency, uh, higher light output, we have used some similar light fixtures in some of their other facilities, but nothing this large. Uh, you notice that there's the marble um, a bowl, uh, which was very uh, prevalent back when the period type of banks. When we uncovered the exterior columns and arched entry, that's when that really brought this into focus, that we really wanted to pursue this. And there was a way of trying to relate to the exterior arch that we could translate that into the inside. And this is sort of like a time capsule of walking from the exterior to the interior. You're going uh, 
from the original exterior arch to this new arch that we created with a barrel vault. And, and, and the vestibule is a little deeper than we might normally make it between the doors to sort of give time to sort of get that sensation that you're walking from one element to the next element and into the lobby element. There was a lot of hours put into that trim uh, on, on getting the arches all lined up and coordinated with all the other trades um, and all the little bits and pieces. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of sanding, um, a lot of attention to the spacing and, and details of it. And then when you turn around and leave here, you know, we'd, we'd thought about things like a clock or other features that we might integrate into it, but we decided not to, not to, you know, contrive it too much and keep it simple and elegant and just let the arch and the transparency of the arch kind of hold its own and, and become the feature that you experience when you walk in and out. I haven't really been in a, in a project exactly like this one, where you're starting one, one way and then you discover some opportunity, you change your path and go a different direction. One nice thing about working for Landmark Bank is they do everything from contemporary to trend, transitional to a, a traditional bank. But never have we done something trying to bring it back to a period. To be able to stop it, rethink the project and even reestablish the budget it takes a client that is interested in, in, in the project, interested in the opportunity, interested in the history. And from a corporate perspective, that's right, sometimes that is challenging to do. But uh, I think on this one, the, the bank was very interested. You know, the location being on the square and having a lot of historical uh, history to it. Most banks at some point in the 1960s or 70s or 80s or 90s built new buildings, new modern buildings to show that they were modern banks. Uh, and that wasn't the case in Medill. So you still have the original bank building being used as a bank. In the evening when it's lit up, uh, the, the square is relatively vacant. You turn the corner and see it. Uh, it. It is a moment of being overwhelmed a little bit. It's, it's a real state of pride and uh, enjoyment you get pulling up and, and pulling in front of a facility like this and an entryway like this to, to help think that you had a small part in, in taking it back to its former glory. Mark's input uh, was invaluable uh, in this whole process. He has, uh, you know, he really wants to have something that is, is long and lasting and something that really makes a statement. We do miss his, uh, his insight, his vision, and uh, his overall concept of the big picture, I guess. You know, here we are in Medill. I can give you a pretty big picture, a good picture of Medill, but Mark could give you a picture of Southern Oklahoma, North Texas, uh, Columbia, Missouri area, Southern Missouri area. He could give that all in one big group picture, which I think we'll miss that. to work in high heels because I thought tellers wore high heels and the, Mary Ann said well you can add these clearings we're talking about a check a stack of checks like this they go to the first national bank yeah they gave me a drawer full of money Mary Ann said this is how you make a deposit and this is how you pay out the cash and you have to balance that drawer at the end of the day and I did to the penny <laughs> It wasn't all work. That's why I think our bank has grown. Uh, it's a lot of play, friendship. This bank has friends. They're all people that work there, help each other. And I'm very proud of this bank. Of course I would be. But I am for the progress that it's made. As uh, I said, as I came here after my dad had been here for a while, 
So as a child, I've seen a lot of change, many changes. Our teller line is just right straight ahead on a diagonal. Absolutely. <laughs>